a tau monoclonal antibody has achieved target clearance in Alzheimer's patients. Why data from UCB represent a critical advance for the field. And why it's too soon to conclude anti-amyloid therapies are safe in the real world. We'll hear our colleague Selena Koch's thoughts on what's happening at the Clinical Trials on Alzheimer's Disease Conference. Plus, you may have heard, there's an election here in the U.S. on Tuesday. Washington editor Steve Usden will tell us what is at stake for FDA and China's NUCO model. It's put a wind in the sails of beleaguered biotechs in China and elsewhere in Asia, as companies are looking for alternative ways to finance themselves while the venture and public markets remain largely closed. We'll discuss all of this on today's BioCentury This Week podcast. I'm Jeff Cranmer, one of the executive editors here at BioCentury, and joining me today are my colleagues. I am Simon Fishburn, editor-in-chief. Selena Koch, executive editor. And Steve Osden, Washington editor. Okay, it's been CTAD all the time here at BioCentury, at least when we're not thinking about the election here in the U.S. Selena has had her finger on the pulse of this big Alzheimer's meeting. She is going to tell you what she thinks about data out of UCB for an anti-tau mab. But first, I want to turn to her thoughts on anti-amyloids as part of our new series called the Perspective Series, where we take turns here on the editorial team to tell you what we really think. We kicked it off two weeks ago with a piece by Steve, and last week, Selena had a little piece. Selena, why don't you tell us what it was all about? Sure. Thanks, Jeff. So just at a higher level, if amyloid has been the star of the show at past CTADs. Really, the year, this year, the spotlight is shifting to tau, both its biomarker uses and as a therapeutic target. But where amyloid kind of featured prominently, so Biogen and Azai's product, Lacanamab, which goes by the brand name Lacambi, has been on the market long enough now that there are reports coming out of, you know, a year's worth of real world data. Of how it's performing in the real world. And several of those were on display at CTAD. And there were just so many questions going into this launch, right? Are people going to be able to access this drug? Are physicians going to be able to manage care appropriately? For example, would patients be able to get the PET scan or cerebral spinal fluid draw needed to confirm they have amyloid buildup in the brain? Will they be able to get their APOE status checked? That's a risk factor. Will they be able to get into an infusion center? every other week to get their IV dosing? And crucially, are they going to be able to get routine MRI scans to monitor for safety? That's a lot of ifs. <laughs> and so the first presentations, what they showed is all of these things can be accomplished. And when physicians, patients, caregivers, you know, do that, when they put all these pieces together on a schedule, contrary to what many of you may have seen in the New York Times recently, treatment can be delivered without a big spike in adverse events. Now, so there was kind of like positivity around this, maybe a slight self-congratulatory sort of sense feeling in the air. So I just wanted to raise the point in my perspective that right now there aren't that many people being treated. You've got about 100 to 200 people tops per institution. And 90 some percent of the patients are urban around these major medical centers. They're white. The physicians doing the prescribing, there's only a handful of them, really. And they're some of the very same physicians that tested these drugs in clinical trials. So you could think of this first year's worth of real data more as an extension of the trials, in a sense. Like, if anybody can do this, these people can do it, right? The question is always going to be, when it's the care is broader, what's going to happen? Yeah, and so, so you hinted at something in your perspective piece, and I'm wondering what you think about it, which is, what happens if a sub-Q version is approved, and it becomes much easier for people to get it either in physicians' offices or even, I guess, possibly at home, is there confidence that all of the other things that you talked about, all those other ifs that have to happen to make sure that care is provided safely, will actually happen? Uh, 
no, <laughs> there's still just a lot of uncertainty. So the point of my perspective is we can't be too self-congratulatory about this, you know, the, that the real test is still coming. So it's both the subcutaneous versions, which are on their way, and blood test for amyloid status. So those have been available for research purposes for a while now, but it's looking like 2025 might be the year when we get approved in vitro diagnostics. So if you can get treated at home, if you can get a diagnosis with the blood draw very easily, you're going to see this now move out into the wider world, into many physicians with no experience with these kinds of therapies, didn't participate in the trials, and haven't built up this judgment for how to deal with these things. So what I'm hearing, Selena, is that you could look at the data that was presented and, you know, in the context of what you've just said, as this is as good as it gets, right? When you have the biggest experts administering the drug, treating patients, doing it exactly by the book as they're supposed to, then yes, these risks can be managed and they're not terrible. So in a way, that's still some level of good news, right? When it's as good as it gets, it's reasonable. It's the what question- we expected. So I wouldn't say that those risks are not bad. So Columbia University has treated 162 patients over 18 months. One of them died from treatment. So like the risks are big risks. And so when you say what we expected, you mean based on the clinical trial results, it's consistent exactly. with that, right? Yeah, right, right. Exactly. And so, you know, here's the concern, the concern, which is the real concern, I think you're absolutely right, is that when you get out more broadly into the population and you have physicians who are not going to be as well versed in the whole administration and, and all the caveats, plus what Steve says, when you start to think about different therapies that might be administered in a sub Q format, then that's when you really get to assess what the real world risks are or safety profiles. That's right. That's what, yeah. And there was, um, there was an international working group that presented on how they think about diagnosis of Alzheimer's, and they put it out there as an alternative to a framework that the Alzheimer's Association put out there. So the Alzheimer's Association basically has in their framework that if you're positive for the core pathologies, right, amyloid tau, then you can be considered having a diagnosis of Alzheimer's. And this international working group is saying, actually, no, we think diagnosis must be done in a clinical context with other factors included. And so if you go into like where these therapies are going from here, right, they're being tested in in a prevention setting in cognitively normal people. The problem is many people who have amyloid positivity in their brain will never go on to develop Alzheimer's. And so in our international working group is saying that this isn't sufficient. And if you think of it as sufficient, then what's going to happen is once these blood tests are out there in the real world, the easiest thing for physicians who aren't well-versed in this stuff to do is just to look at that and consider it the diagnosis by itself. And you may end up with people treated who really shouldn't be. What are the, the guardrails? What are the guardrails for that, Selena? You talked about the working group. Are they proposing specific actions and guardrails to prevent that? Right now, they think, you know, you need to make a diagnosis that is a constellation of a bunch of clinical factors in addition to the pathologies. And that in cognitively normal people, they need to be considered at risk asymptomatic. That's the language they propose. Whereas like the Alzheimer's Association just says you can call them all in pre-symptomatic disease. So these are different schools of thoughts, but they have kind of repercussions once you think about these things moving out more broadly. The other thing, I mean, it has, it seems like what you're saying is that there's a possibility for people who never would have developed Alzheimer's disease to be exposed to one of these drugs and to suffer ill effects, perhaps even death from it. But another thing that it strikes me is it's really going to muddy the waters on trying to assess efficacy. Because if you have a, people who, it's unpredictable who is, who is actually going to progress to get Alzheimer's disease. If you're treating people pre-symptomatically, then some of them are not going to progress to Alzheimer's disease who wouldn't have progressed in the absence of a treatment, right? And you might also be seeing a treatment effect that either prevents progression to Alzheimer's or delays it, but it's going to be extraordinarily difficult and probably contentious to um, yeah. evaluate that. So people will tell you, once you started confirming that patients were amyloid positive, trials of amyloid maps 
the, the chances of those trials being successful went way up because they were just enrolling people who never even had the target in the brain, right? So it's possible that we're now in the pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic, however you think about it, prevention trials, that something similar is going to happen. If we don't have a good way of sorting these patients out, who's going to progress and who isn't? How are you going to get a signal? How are you going to show it? a difference in progression if your placebo group doesn't progress on average. And there are potentially ways, there's just a ton of biomarker research coming out right now, looking at the interplay between various biomarkers and trying to like create clocks, tau clock or whatever, to predict who really is going to progress and in what time frame. So if you see tau, PET signal, going beyond the medial temporal lobe into the cortex more broadly in the neocortex, it's starting to look like maybe those patients are very likely to have Alzheimer's symptoms coming in, in five-ish years. Now that's preliminary and we need more data to know for sure. But once we get, you know, those kinds of things can kind of help, I think, sort out that prevention setting. Well, you've talked about um, tau, Selena, and obviously you've been following the various other mechanisms. And it seems to me that this is a lot of a really important conversation, but it's also a snapshot in time that I'm sure we're going to look back on this with much more information in three years, four years, five years of how it played out. One of the issues, it seems to me, is that what we're really talking about, I'm not really sure if I'm supposed to say this or not, but these are drugs with marginal efficacy. Or so they're not really like slam dunks. We're not talking about the obesity medications that have unequivocal, massive effects that you can figure out what your risks are relative to those effects. Here, you're talking about quite serious concerns. You're not sure which of those people will actually develop the disease and the drugs themselves, you know, have some efficacy, but they're not slam dunks. And so as those, you know, differences start to tease themselves out, maybe more mechanisms come in. I think that these conversations, as I said, well, like in five years time, we'll be looking very differently, I hope, at least at this issue. Yeah, I mean, hopefully other therapeutic modalities are going to come into play that will be safer. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to... And more effective. And more effective. Right, and just to add one point, I don't want to underestimate the impact that these breakthroughs have had on the field. I think it's because they got approved, because they put all that money into those trials and kept in there, that they've broken this barrier and there is a lot of activity in the field. So they've de-risked the overall idea. Mm -hmm. And now the others yeah. have got to come in and do the job. And, and you could, if you think that there's any value in these drugs, you could say that these physician leaders who have put all these pieces of the treatment continuum together at their institutions to get these patients treated are kind of heroic in their efforts because it's a tall order. How it gets democratized, though, is beyond me. <laughs> you know, I, I, there's I, one I, vision I, where, go ahead. I think there's a case also for saying that the patients and their families are heroic because it's arduous putting all the pieces together, taking all the time to get all of the scans and the MRIs, then the frequent infusions and so on is is not something for the faint of heart. And it's not something that is easy for either for the patients or for their caregivers. Yeah. So there was a, I totally agree with that. I just wanted to add that there was a vision put forward by Rachel Duty, who was basically, I can't remember her exact title, but head of neurodegeneration drug development at Roche during the Gantaneuramad trials. And she gave a keynote in which she said, the only way this is getting democratized is if we can essentially create an algorithm. If we can automate diagnosis and treatment where you take the physical exam, you take the patient history, you take the biomarkers, you take the cognitive assessments, you feed all of these things into a standard algorithm that tells the physician out there in rural wherever this person has normal aging or this person has MCI or or whatever. And, and if you could extend that to the treatment, the, you know, their best treatment option would be this thing. So the, <laughs> I don't know. How, I think all of those, I think there are some efforts going on. I think they're very early pilot type efforts, but it's an interesting idea. All righty. So Staying with the CTAD theme, Alzheimer's data presented by UCB provides some of the first clues about what species of tau to target and in which patients. Lena. Yeah. So antibody therapies for tau are quite popular. Many of them have been in development. If you've been following this at all, you've probably seen a lot of phase two failures, at least four major ones, you know, for big companies have missed their endpoints in phase two. 
all four of them have been directed against the N-terminus of tau. And there's been research suggesting that tau is this, like, it undergoes a lot of processing cleavage in different ways to put out these fragments, these forms of tau. It's kind of like a diverse ecosystem of tau species. So when you talk about tau as a target, it's actually much more complicated. But the thought is that that M-terminus often gets chopped out. So the tau that gets secreted forms these misfolded proteins, peptide seeds that then get taken up by the next neuron and spread the pathology through the brain. This is one hypothesis. Doesn't contain them. And so that's why those antibodies didn't work. That's one interpretation. Now we have these next generation of antibodies that are looking at, um, that are targeting the uh, mid region domain in tau, either the microtubule binding domain or, or one near it. And so those studies are underway. And what we saw with the first one to read out, which was UCB's bipranamab, it too missed its primary endpoint. <laughs> but if you look beyond the primary endpoint, the story does get a lot more interesting. It had a statistically significant effect on an efficacy measure, a secondary one. So that's something not achieved by any of the past ones. Another thing it achieved that past ones didn't is that it reduced tau aggregates in the brain as measured by PET imaging. So in this uh, kind of medial temporal area by 50-ish percent in the broader brain by, I think it was 35, 40%, something like that. And so that would suggest that this hypothesis that tau spreads the way I described extracellularly might be right, because if you, the antibodies only work extracellularly. So now we have one that actually intercepts tau extracellularly and decreases that PET signal. Why did it not have a bigger effect on cognition? Not sure there's any number, there's like many possible explanations. But when they looked, you know, at the pre-specified subgroups and then the post-hoc analyses, some interesting patterns emerged. The biggest thing is that patients with low tau at baseline seem to get a lot more benefit. And that makes sense with the number of other studies presented at the conference, which are starting to create this picture that <laughs> there's this term getting used called catastrophe, <laughs> where tau is not this like continue thing that rises continuously after amyloid or whatever, that there's this moment in time where you get some kind of a switch-like thing happening where you get a big boost in tau. And then once you get appreciable tau pet, like outside of that medial temporal lobe, you really are seeing symptoms ramp up. So it may be, even with tau, that the treatment window, like the idea was a treatment window might be a little later than with amyloid, but it might be even with tau, you're going to need to treat pretty early before catastrophe. Yeah. I mean, I have to tell you most of the time when I hear, yeah, we didn't make the primary endpoint, but look mm -hmm. at the secondaries, you know, that's always mm -hmm. a bit of a, you know, warning signal, but this is one case. We actually had another one quite recently with multiple sclerosis, the Sanofi trial, when we talked to Danny Bright, where actually there is some very interesting mechanistic insight that you can get from those signals that came through. And you're right, it's just a hypothesis. Nobody's sort of yeah. over-ramping it. You might be the, the main one, in fact, to, to have done this. And I would, uh, for the geeks among our audience, I encourage you to look at this really cool schematic that Selena put together with the structure, well, sort of linear structure of tau and where the antibodies are that have been tested. And it really helps you understand why, even though previous antibodies that have been tested have missed the end point, why this different region might actually under underlie a different result here. So it actually also, I would note, it seems to me that the tau field has learned from one thing from the amyloid folk, which is failed trials, keep going, keep going, keep going. Right. Like this, like that. <laughs> it like, can it, actually like, work. <laughs> it is a complicated target. It is yeah. a slowly developing disease with these various pathologies you're going to have windows where certain mechanisms work and other windows when others do. And of course, ultimately, you're going to need combinations. But yeah, you're right. I mean, let me emphasize, this is the failed trial, right? right. It's negative. And Roche looked at this data and gave back rights to UCB. But that said, are there some learnings for the field? I think there might be. All right. Well, both of those pieces up on biocentury.com. Go to biocenturypodcast.com. Links will be in the show notes. Okay, so November 5th, a lot of yeah, us... Yeah, what have, of it, Jeff? What a, 
it's uh, one of 365 days of the year. I have to tell you, this, my calendar is apparently not made in the U.S. It does not even mark anything significant about November the 5th on it. Yeah. So maybe I'll, maybe I'll get that calendar every four years. Yeah, fall back. Anyway, uh, well, needless to say, there's a lot of steak tomorrow. We're recording this Monday morning. A lot at stake for the White House, the House, the Senate, and much more. But top of mind for us here at BioCentury and for our colleague Steve, who's sitting quite close to the center of the madness, is what's at stake for FDA. Steve, how are you thinking through things? I think that if you're thinking purely about FDA and not about other issues, that you can look at it this way. If Harris is elected, we're likely to see continuity from what's um, been happening over the last four years and honestly what's been happening over the last 30 years, which is nonpartisan leadership of FDA. It's not known who Kamala Harris would select to run the FDA. People who are close to the to the Biden administration I think there's a good chance that she would pick Najami Bumpus. Um, she's the number two at FDA now, but it's unlikely that Kamala Harris has even given this any thought. So the idea of continuity you know, it's good and it's bad. There are people who, who would think that that's fantastic, especially given the alternatives. And there are also an, an awful lot of people who think in the biopharm industry that um, FDA needs some changes and that, you know, they wouldn't be necessarily rooting for continuity. If Trump is reelected, it's, it's going to be a, a discontinuous situation. And there are two kind of schools of thought among Republicans in Washington in the biopharm industry as to what a Trump administration would be like for FDA. There are people who look at the things, his embrace of um, RFK Jr. and the things that RFK Jr. and other uh, members of the Trump retinue have said about FDA and medical issues. They take them at face value and they're quite concerned. There's a lot of discussion about anti-vax. There's attack on the pharmaceutical industry as being purveyors of poison. There's attacks on FDA officials and threats to them and things like that that some find to be, you know, quite concerning, obviously. The interesting thing to me is that there's also another kind of cohort of Republican CEOs and um, lobbyists, more concentrated, I'd say, on the pharma side than on the biotech side, who say, you know, look, this is all just campaign bluster. We've seen it before, and it's really not likely to come to pass if Trump is um, reelected. They point out that there was a similar kind of angst in 2016 and 2017 Peter Thiel, a libertarian from Silicon Valley, was pushing for an FDA commissioner who would be, well, what most people in the industry would think would be disastrous. Instead, Scott Gottlieb got the job, and I think he may be the only Senate-confirmed member of Trump's administration who left office with respect both of Democrats and Republicans. The question is, which, you know, which, which would we get in a, a second Trump administration? Obviously, nobody really knows the answer. But I think that there, there's data points pointing both ways, right? This is also, this isn't the first time that we've heard about RFK having a big influence over healthcare policy. I went to a press conference in 2017 where, and, and I met RFK there, where um, he announced that Trump had uh, planned to make him the head of a commission that was going to investigate vaccines, as he suggested at the time, lead to the withdrawal of a lot of vaccines from the market. That didn't happen. On the other hand, there are people who look at what happened the first time and the end of the of the first Trump administration, and they worry, right? Because there are people who are involved in the transition planning for HHS this time who strongly believe in political control over FDA and political control over the um, civil service. They have a history of exerting political influence over public health agencies, and public health has become tremendously politicized now. And also there's concerns they could get caught up in a wider kind of ideological attack on what Trump and Trump supporters call the regulatory state. So first of all, I do want to tell our listeners that we had a little conversation ahead of this because we know that some people will listen on Monday, some people will listen on Tuesday, maybe some on Wednesday, some on Thursday. Who knows how much of the who wins will still be a conversation there. And then we decided not to tempt the evil eye. And so we decided we would discuss it and raise it as two possibilities. I have to say, you know, we have seen during the previous Trump administration, and I wrote a piece about this in 2021, 
the real dangers to our industry of questioning facts and truth. And I think that that is something that unfortunately led to the huge vaccine skepticism during the pandemic. And that had a very, very real cost in terms of hundreds of thousands of lives. So I think that people will take the view that they're going to do. They'll think about FDA. They'll think about whether one candidate or another is going to be beholden to certain either people or principles or ways of thinking or whether they get in the job and they just do something completely different than what they said they were going to do. But I do think that this is, and Steve, you're going to write about this next week, I'm sure, who the head of the FDA is, is one of the most important things for our industry, probably the most important thing for our industry. Maybe you would say HHS as well. There's also the head of NIH. But even beyond that, there is the regard for science and the ability for science to become and, and regulation to become independent of politics. So, you know, go out there, vote. Yeah, that's, that's interesting, Steve. So there's a variety of opinions over what might be to come for FDA. So we're going to be hearing from you uh, next Monday. Hopefully we'll have uh, clean and clear results that we can talk about rather than going back to the hanging Chad days of yesteryear. Hopefully somebody got that Chad down. I'm actually wondering, you know, how many, uh, like, what generation are we? How many of our listeners are in the hanging Chad remembering era? Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, Bush Gore, um, probably dating myself a little bit, but uh, uh, with with age comes wisdom, hopefully. No, Steve, there's a tipping let's... point for that, you know, Jack. There's a tipping <laughs> point. Okay. Let's not um, go I'll down. let you know when I get there, Simone, so yeah, you can yeah, be ready yeah. yourself. I know you're a ways away from oh, such things. So. Uh, Steve, I do want to stick with FDA a little bit. Amy Rick, uh, she used to be the CEO of the Food and Drug Law Institute, consultant at Levitt Partners. She is now joining the agency's Rare Disease Innovation Hub. What's in store? Well, it's interesting. She's going to be leading FDA's oh, okay. Rare Disease Innovation I, Hub. I've, I've been away. I missed a thing or two. And, and the choice really is being celebrated by patient advocacy groups. And I think it's good news for companies that are trying to bring therapies to rare disease patients as well. Amy was CEO of the Food and Drug Law Institute for about eight years. When I first met her about a dozen years ago, when we were both teenagers, she led a patient group, the Parkinson's Action Network. She's had experience in government. And most recently, as you said, she was working at Levitt Partners, advocating for changes in the law to change provisions in the Inflation Reduction Act that disincentivize the development of orphan drugs. It really remains to be seen what the hub is, really, and what it's going to do. And I think, to a great extent, Amy's going to define its role. She understands the issues, including the desperate needs of patients and the importance of keeping snake oil off the market, as well as anyone does. And she understands FDA, and she understands how Washington works. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what she does. Excellent. And I'm sure you'll keep us abreast. Alrighty, well, I am just back from Shanghai, where we held our 11th BioCentury Bay Helix China Summit with a big, big assist from our friends at McKinsey. And got to say, the mood was a lot brighter than 2023, but biotech is still very much mired in its first ever bear market in China and there's a lot of anxiety over geopolitics. We've talked a lot about the Biosecure Act on this pod. A lot of anxiety over sustainable financing. The tap has been turned off in the public markets. Venture money is scarce. The IPO window is very narrow. There's only been about three this year, all on the Hong Kong exchange. The star exchange is still shut for biotechs. And we're seeing a lot of companies decoupling their China and U.S. sides or pivoting more to the U.S. But uh, there's this NUCO model, that's NUCO with a capital N, and an early wave of M&A that's kind of lifted spirits, as was apparent in the hallways of the St. Regis Jing'an, where we held the conference. And the NUCOs, these are China assets that are housed into typically a U.S. company backed by U.S. VCs. We've seen Ken Song follow up the sale of Ray's Bio by creating Candid, pulling together 
deals with Epimab and another China company to bring in a few assets. Orbamed's Donnie McGrath has created a new co called Bellinos. And nearly every executive I spoke with while in Shanghai is planning or looking for one of these deals. But I also got the sense that it's a bit bittersweet, Simone. The valuation, I think people are feeling like they're not quite able to get their full valuation. And at the same time, it's not like these biotechs can bank on their home market as the reimbursement regime has become a real pain point for smaller biotechs. You know, they need a big partner to take their products to the people. Here's what I'd say, Jeff. And unfortunately, I didn't go to China this year. But as you know, I've been for like six, seven, eight of the last few years. And, you know, just a few a few comments about that. From when I started going to China, which I think was around maybe 2014 or mm. so to now, I mean, it is just night and day what the biotech industry and ecosystem looks like. It didn't really exist. It was Me Too's. But there was tremendous enthusiasm and energy. And I think there's still, you know, you, I'm sure, witnessed this yourself firsthand. It is just irrepressible enthusiasm and energy there. Even, I think, when, you know, they are going through what is their first bear market, really. They have not Mm -hmm. got those uh, scars, let's say, that our Western biotech ecosystems, including Europe, have got. But the level of innovation and, you know, it has just matured at an incredible rate. So I think it's not really possible to cap that, right? That genie is out of the bottle and those people are going to find ways to keep innovating and keep finding solutions, which your new co-model is the latest of. Mm -hmm. Hopefully for them, some market comes back. You know, on the question of valuations, and I think there are probably many entrepreneurs here, including some first-time ones who have actually walked that walk themselves quite recently, there's no such thing as the real valuation, right? (laughs) Nor is there for my house or for your car, Jeff. It's sort of, it's what the market will do. And so I think that also here in the US and maybe a little bit less in Europe, but people walked around thinking, no, 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 that's not the real value. The real valuation by company is what it was in 2019 or 2021. This other stuff, that's just a blip. So I think that there'll be some adjustment, I expect, there. Mm-hmm. And it, it's never nice to see geopolitics really get in the way here. I, I don't really want to comment on that, but I just think that so many innovators and and buy-siders as well have recognized the actual value. And it's about patience, right? You've got innovations there that are valuable for patients. And so there's going to be a way and the community there is going to find a way to get those innovations into drug development. Yeah, as 100% right, Simone. And, And that, you know, the swagger is still there. I mean, a lot of people talking about how China is the fastest market to take scientific ideas into humans. Uh, A lot of talk about, a lot of predictions about just how much innovation is coming down the pipeline. I heard, you know, it was all off the record, so I can't quote quotes, but I'll just say that um, the innovation is wild. They're proud of it. They're ready to move quickly there. And so they're going to move very quickly into this new co-model, and then we'll see what's next. Uh, Resilience. I will tell you, Jeff, it's it's only this model until the next one comes along. This is a a fast-moving scene there. It's it's true. All right, well, we'll leave it there. I have a few China stories coming down the pipeline, so uh, keep your eyes on this space. As always, I'd like to remind you of what was on our latest episode of our sister podcast. That's the BioCentury Show. This one's a real good one. It's Steve in conversation with FDA's Richard Pazder. So do check that out. You can find it wherever you get your podcasts. There's also a uh, a video version that you can find on our YouTube channel. Thanks for tuning in. Kendall Square Orchestra provides the music for BioCentury this week. The group connects science and technology professionals and other members of the greater Boston community to collaborate, innovate, and inspire through music while supporting causes related to healthcare and education.